Thanks for joining us for another episode of TN Trials, the series from the Florida Public Archaeology Network, where we chat with archaeologists about their research and what archaeology means to them. I'm one of your hosts, Emily Jane Murray, and today I'm excited to be chatting with Uzi Baram, a professor of anthropology at New College of Florida. Hi, Uzi, how's it going? Hello, Emily Jay. Thank you for having me on. This is great. Looking forward to this discussion. Awesome. Um, would you like to tell us anything else about yourself and then introduce your mug? But let me do the mug first. I'm going to go out of order. So I have uh, my Heritage Monitoring Scouts mug uh, that I got when we had, yay, a pan, because <laughs> it made a big difference. <laughs> I've been such a fan of FPAN from the beginning when you all started. It just really let me do what I've always kind of thought I would be doing when I became an archaeologist, uh, when I got my degrees in anthropology, uh, because I was really lucky, I guess. I jumped into uh, archaeology because of an intro class. As I was born in Haifa, Israel, uh, my parents came to the U.S. when I was a little kid, so I was raised on Long Island, New York, and like a lot of uh, others uh, on Long Island, I went to SUNY Binghamton. Awesome. Um, well, I, I also brought kind of a, a mug themed to that uh, heritage at risk as well. So it's, uh, it's tropical flowers that are now in the water here um, because of, yeah, all of the great collaboration that we've had working with you on heritage at risk projects. So get to our questions here. You, you, you touched on the first one here a little. Um, what made you want to become an archaeologist? Yeah, I think it really was that sense that we could look into the past and, and we didn't, they didn't use the language at the time, but now, you know, uh, I, I went to grad school with Ken Sassman, who's done such a good job with archaeology as, uh, you know, looking towards potential futures uh, that I have to tip my hat uh, to Ken for coming up with that language. But it's always kind of that notion that I love the anthropology and the classes that were really, well, again, we didn't use this language back then, but anti-racist, right? So there was just, as an immigrant, this really you know, firm sense that there's something really wrong when you divide people up. And the anthropology, particularly the anthropology professors I had, both at SUNY Binghamton, then UMass Amherst, who are really committed to fighting against racism, doing the critique, uh, you know, in all sorts of ways. And then that sense, and I think I had got in the intro class and then just, you know, so many more places, all these interesting things had happened in history. All sorts of other ways of organizing uh, people's social relations and possibilities. Uh, for whatever reason, I've never really been a fan of hierarchies. Never kind of uh, enjoyed them. And to be able to realize that you could study uh, human history in terms of ways that people are egalitarian, that they are able to overthrow monarchs and pharaohs and the rest. And we have all that evidence, uh, that mutual support and sharing is just such a, gigantic theme throughout human history and that we had evidence for it. And uh, my age uh, is, is telling, the Indiana Jones films that came out in the 80s when I was an undergraduate, right, gave that sort of cool aspect to it. <laughs> and, you know, I do have my uh, fedora and my, my wool whip, I, I keep in my office uh, just in case. Uh, and of course, we know the critiques of those movies and the, how they, you know, pull on colonial imperialist themes. But also, there's particularly the United States, but you know, in other places around the world, archaeology is seen as a good thing, right? No, there's very few uh, folks who don't get excited by it, and to be able to take that excitement and work with it to say, hey, look at all that humans have done. And maybe what we can do really keeps me animated in the field. And, and I'll say uh, uh, there was also, you know, so many people who were just supportive just at the right moments. Uh, one of whom, when I started my graduate program at UMass Amherst, uh, the person who founded the department uh, decades before uh, was Dick Woodbury, who has long since passed on, uh, but he had been retired when I started, but the 
faculty were cl clear, they invited him to you know, meet the new cohorts. They've done that every year. Uh, Dick Woodbury, you might know, worked with Gordon Willie on that survey of the Gulf Coast, right? Something I hadn't thought about until I got the job at New College much, much later. But one of the things Dick Woodbury was really clear on, his whole career is based on basically uh, curiosity and having opportunities. Right, so it wasn't theory less, but it was be interested in things, you know, be, be interested in all things human. And if a door opens, go through it. I think that's excellent, just life advice too, <laughs> to just go with it and don't say no. And yeah, see what happens and uh, be creative, right? You know, theory based, of course. Uh, make sure you have some connections. And, you know, I, again, just was very lucky uh, to have faculty who encouraged my, uh, when I was undergraduate, it wasn't just Randy McGuire, but Meg Conkey was at Binghamton. And when she was just kind of uh, putting forward feminist archaeology. So I didn't know that, I didn't know that archaeologists didn't do that. So my professors were doing Marxist archaeology, feminist archaeology, uh, post-colonial, they were just doing it. And I thought, I didn't know any better. I, my parents uh, were born and raised in Israel. They had really uh, no sense of the American educational system. Uh, so, you know, we, we now use this term first generation. Uh, you know, it was, it was really first generation. I went in, uh, we didn't use that language, but I had no preconceived notions. And so what I was hearing, I assume just was, and you know, kind of similarly at the UMass Amherst, it was like, oh, this is what folks are doing. As I read more, as I know more, it was like, oh, wait, I had a particular kind of track. Uh, but I think, again, I was incredibly lucky that same track is now kind of what we should be doing, right? It, very kind of critical, uh, post-colonial feminist archeology span and anthropology, uh, I think is where we should be and being able to think about both the empirical evidence, right, doing the work well, but also what are the implications of the stories we're telling? Um, well, do you want to tell us a little bit about some of your research in, in 30 yeah. seconds or so? The SAA Archaeological Bulletin had a nice essay, you know, when to retire, and it's like, yep, thinking about that uh, sort of thing. And, I, you know, when I kind of project forward what will be the story of my career. It's actually the project that I'm working on right now, but one that also I've been working on for 15 years. Uh, a decade and a half ago, a community member came to my office uh, in College Hall, asking me to join an uh, interdisciplinary research group called Looking for Angola. And I had known about this Maroon community, then referred to as an escaped slave community on the Manatee River. And I was excited to join in. And the first steps were public outreach. And then we did very small scale uh, excavations, uh, a lot of programming, a lot of interpreting of the meager results. And then last, last January, got uh, funding to do massive excavations. And we've been working in the lab uh, since the summer, uh, thanks to the Division of Historical Resources uh, grant. Uh, finding out more about daily life for the people who escaped from enslavement and found freedom and liberty in early 19th century Florida. And it touches on all the themes that my training led to. So on one hand, we get to really delve into day life of people who created a community under the most horrific conditions in a very difficult place, and that was successful. We know it's successful because we know their descendants. And we know how much the spirit of Angola lived on in the peoples of Andros Island in the Bahamas. Uh, it's always been a very public uh, project, encouraging uh, people to come and see what we're doing, encouraging the media to cover us. Uh, the joke I always make is as soon as they take a shovel anywhere in Sarasota, Manatee counties, uh, TV cameras will be there, and that's held for this project as well. And that through the Time Sifters Archaeological Society, our local chapter, the Florida Anthropological Society, presentations using their newsletter to just let people know we have, of course, limitations during this COVID-19 pandemic, 
uh, but still trying to let people come in and see. Uh, thanks to FPAN, West Central, Jeff Motza and Becky O'Sullivan. A really nice video about what we're doing came out a couple of weeks ago uh, in September of uh, 2020 for International Underground Railroad Month uh, to kind of let people know, yeah, we have evidence of really courageous people who created a life for themselves and their families and their comrades uh, on the south side of the Manatee River. And it only lasted a couple of decades, but it was enough so their descendants could live in freedom elsewhere. And so all those notions uh, kind of come to the fore with this Angola project. It's a, a really beautiful story to be able to tell as well about, I mean, that's uh, one of the reasons that I love archaeology too, is to be able to like tease those, those stories out. Like, yeah. Amazing. Yeah, and to let people know this is, you know, her heritage beneath their feet, that it's, it's all around us. And of course, it ties into uh, the other concerns, right? Because I live here in Sarasota. Uh, my office uh, in College Hall, the former Charles and Edith uh, Ringling uh, Mansion, built in 1926, is right on Sarasota Bay. And it's a part of the concerns is how much is going to be lost as sea levels rise, as hurricanes come more frequently. And the more that we can disseminate the information about these really fantastic histories, the more we can get people to realize, no, we don't want to lose them without knowing about them. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to have this part of our collective consciousness, our, our archive of information about those who came before us and as well as being inspired by the Maroons, by the pre-Columbian indigenous people, by the Cuban fishing rancho inhabitants, uh, by so many people who've walked here and left evidence, material evidence of their lives that we can bring forward, share, and be good to think about. So um, do you have a favorite tool in your toolkit uh, that you use when you do some of this work? So my favorite tool uh, is actually the collaboration with community members, right? Uh, I'll say that kind of by personality, I've taken those uh, personality tests and I'm an introvert, right? And it makes sense. There's, there's no way one is a graduate student, uh, sits in, uh, my, my dissertation was based on uh, Ottoman period material culture from the Eastern Mediterranean and to be a, it was sit with ceramics, uh, uh, coffee cup fragments and clay tobacco pipe fragments and Gaza ware, and think about it and organize it. Uh, you can't do that and be really a, a social person. <laughs> you gotta like well, enjoy being by yourself for long periods of time. And yep, that's true, right? Even uh, being a professor, a lot of it is just sitting, being alone, uh, figuring out things. Uh, not by necessity, but it's kind of there. So when given the opportunity, yeah, I'd rather be uh, on, on the you know, sidelines <laughs> and the center things. Uh, but again, I, the training I had, the people I've met who I've respected, and kind of the ethics of all this work is you gotta engage community members. And so I think of it as a tool because I wouldn't use it if I didn't have to. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the work I do with community members is, is very much the uh, obligation that I need to chat with. And it's worked so well right, for so many projects, uh, particularly the local projects, have been sustained by people who get so excited by the work. And uh, again, we'll just pick on, uh, focus on the Angola project that we've been working so long and thanks to uh, by people in Sarasota's African-American community, so much inspiration, so much support. Uh, but then just a few years ago, one of the descendants who happened to live in Brainton but hadn't heard about the project came across the heritage interpretation signs we had put up, uh, got in touch with me and then pushed the project even forward, right? And got to the next steps and has been such a pleasure to work with and through her kin relations around the area, brought in more people who just care so deeply 
and remind me that, no, no, this is important to do, that the hard work of going through the materials, the kind of politics, mm -hmm. uh, getting funding and making sure that funding is going forward, dealing with all the details, and of course the report writing that uh, comes across, uh, finding time between classes, administrative duties, to do all that is worthwhile. <laughs> because it's in partnership with community members and uh, I think it's probably the long-lasting contribution. Well and it's definitely a, a skill uh, you know to work on and to hone and it, it does take practice yeah. and, and I like that. I like yeah. that as a tool. <laughs> yes, yeah, so you got to go sharpen it just like you need to sharpen your travel. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so do you have a best, worst field story that you can now laugh about? <laughs> I mean, I think the, uh, I worked uh, doing CRM during my graduate career. You, you take extra money uh, to get through life. And there was one project where I, the crew, we did so many, this was up in the Northeast, USA, so many SDPs that came up with nothing. No evidence of any uh, human modifications. And it's the worst because there's two levels of being the worst. One, uh, if anyone who's ever done that kind of STP survey, you know, if you get nothing after nothing after nothing, it gets a little tired someday after day. And so there was just kind of that immediate, uh, Yep, another 50 by 50 centimeter hole in the ground. Yep, here's the organic level and here's the sterile. And yep, we're just finding some roots and some pebbles and rocks and nothing else. Uh, but also it was terrible because it was only late on in my career. It was, wow, we were really doing this the wrong way. That I am not a fan anymore of doing those kind of surveys because people don't live in 50 by 50 centimeter holes in the ground five or ten meters apart i think we were doing 10 meters apart that's not how people live their lives and in fact uh, uh, an archaeologist up in new england russ hansman uh, gave a really great conference paper at one point uh, really just lambasting the whole approach and it's like oh my god i was complicit in something that was erasing native history I pretend nothing was there when nothing actually is something. So on two levels, that was really bad. Although I appreciate having the, the money to pay rent <laughs> at the time. Tramping through the woods, digging <laughs> holes. It's like, why am I even digging the holes? I know that. Feeling. <laughs> yeah, we came up with some songs about it. I don't need to repeat them now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, we save our big question for last year. Um, how do you think archaeology can help save the world? How can it help save the world? Uh, yeah, I do think it's meaningful. And I'm actually really glad that we're now talking about that because when I was an undergraduate, uh, I had a political awakening when I went to college. I was basically uh, apolitical growing up on Long Island. and started kind of getting a sense of, well, wow, there's things we can do, and then even more so uh, when I, during my graduate days. And I, I did my dissertation work uh, in Cyprus, Greece, uh, Turkey, Israel, where as you might be aware, there's some particularly harsh uh, political realities, right? So always a sense that, no, this is meaningful. People care, especially in the Eastern Mediterranean, people care you know, desperately about what the archaeology says. And, uh, you know, I credit Barbara Little back in 2007 when she published that piece in Historical Archaeology. You know, what can archaeology do? I, I'll get the, the exact title wrong, but what can archaeology do for peace, justice, and the earth, right? So all those things. And I do think it matters, right? Uh, it's uh, underlied a lot of what I do, but it comes about, uh, from my particular, and it's been kind of reassuring I can do this. I, I was uh, born and raised Jewish, and particularly the Reform Judaism that I was raised with, that I still belong to in terms of my synagogue uh, membership, 
uh, really puts Tikkun HaOlam at the center, the healing of the world, that we recognize the world is fragmented, and that part of our task is to put this back together. And it's both a wonderful metaphor, as we think about archaeology, putting pieces together, but also that kind of need to do it, but also with a lot of humility, right? That's uh, part of the teachings in Tikkun HaOlam is we're not going to finish the task because it's overwhelming, but we can contribute what we can contribute. And so I think archaeology does so much to one, get people to realize there were people before us walking on this land, right? That I've been doing the indigenous acknowledgement in all my public presentations and in my classes to remind and really sometimes to teach people there are more people here before us. That's where I am right now uh, is the traditional lands of the Seminole and Miccosukee people and that we have a responsibility to honor and respect their heritage on this land that we're dwelling on. Uh, that we face tremendous challenges today, uh, but we're not the first generation to face tremendous challenges. Uh, we can look towards the past to see that, in fact, people have survived and sometimes even flourished when there were challenges. And that's again all that storehouse of knowledge. And we can see with the different ways people have dealt with uh, challenges, environmental, social, political, economic, uh, uh, think about what our possible futures are. Right? So I think about the challenges we have with the Anthropocene, with rising sea levels and more frequent hurricanes, and look towards the archaic. I look towards uh, political systems that are unstable, and I think about what happens when uh, the pharaoh's uh, new kingdom starts falling apart, uh, when the Hittite empire falls apart, uh, from my Middle East work, uh, I think hard about, uh, and we just, uh, I've been part of this for a while, uh, the elders among the African American community in Sarasota and how they overcame segregation, the civil rights activists who were able to desegregate the public library, desegregate the beaches, the schools, and the courage they had to do that, right? And some of those elders are still with us and carry forward that spirit. So all of that gives us faith. And I've been, since Tyler United uh, came to Sarasota, I've been giving a lot of uh, presentations. And I always correct my colleagues in environmental sciences. We don't need to save the earth. The earth is fine. It's a rock. The rock's going to be here for millions more years. What do we want to be saving? I don't want to save the present inequalities, I have no urge. The gross inequalities today are not productive. They're not productive for me. They're not productive for people I care about. And I don't think they're productive uh, in the long term uh, for the environment or for social relations. We want to save what's best in humanity. We want to open doors for that to flourish. We want more equity. At least I want more equity. I want more access to information. I want more possibilities. And I think archaeology, particularly anthropological archaeology as we practice it here in the United States, uh, opens those doors and makes things possible. So very much uh, healing our world, Tikkun uh, HaOlam. I think that's just very like humbling and also like reassuring in, in an odd way to think like uh, like I've never quite had that perspective it's like oh man like people have been dealing with a lot of terrible things and we're not special you know but like they kept like we've kept on keeping on as a as a species so to be able to think long term I have three teenagers Right. And I think about my teenagers, and I have no doubt uh, about the challenges they face. And it's, uh, uh, they, are str they have stresses on them. Uh, some of it is based on anti-Semitism and racism. Some of it is just the type of structures they have to go through to get uh, through their classes. Uh, the economy is not in great shape. They have to really think harder, much harder than I had to at that age about 
why they would go to college, how to afford it, why they would go, what would happen afterwards. Uh, but our task is not just the immediate one, but to think about three, four generations for now. Right? That uh, I know I know very little about my family history because we've just faced disasters. Right? Uh, uh, my great grandparents. It's just very confusing. They seem to have both lived in Haifa and gone to uh, basically what's now Ukraine back and forth. Not quite sure how that went about, uh, except when you look at the map, it, it was just going from the Ottoman Empire to the Russian Empire. It wasn't that many borders. Uh, and I'm not quite sure how long they've been in Haifa, uh, then part of the Ottoman Empire, but they went back and forth. But some of my relatives faced uh, pogroms and faced uh, Cossack attacks and you know, fled southward. Uh, there's one elsewhere. My maternal side, uh, they faced the Shoah, the Holocaust. And my grandfather got on a boat from Greece to Egypt and jumped off and swam to British control Palestine. We faced challenges, but you know, my family members faced worse. And that expression you might uh, know of, uh, you know, more popularized in the African American communities, uh, that our ancestors hoped for us. Right, because I'm sitting right now as a professor of anthropology at the Honors College of the State University of Florida. And that's pretty wild for family members, uh, ancestors who are peasants, that that somehow came about. And it's not that my kids are going to have it easy. It's not that if I have grandkids, they would have it, but maybe three or four, if we keep up with the optimism, right? That we have responsibilities way beyond ourselves. And we do the work that we think is meaningful and hopefully we're right. That opens doors, that provides those opportunities. And yeah, who knows what descendants might be able to accomplish. I uh, am quite hopeful that they will live in a world with a lot more equity a lot more beauty and a lot more opportunities for the full flowering of human imagination and possibilities. We've seen it in various points in the past that it's happened. Maybe it's going to happen again. Optimism. That's... Optimism. <laughs> Keep hope alive, right? It's <laughs> but not just about tomorrow, but really think about uh, several generations down the line, whether it's direct descendants. All right, it's a line that uh, I started using as well. Uh, what kind of ancestors do we want to be? Mm, I like that. And again, we think about archaeology. We know there were ancestors. I love teaching it. Uh, when I look at the classroom of students, you all had ancestors. Right? It's just the, the biological reality. There must have been someone. For some students, they know they can go back hundreds of years. They have that privilege of knowing of their family members generations back. Uh, others are more like me, where it's like, yeah, I know I had <laughs> great grandparents, um, but I don't know. We have almost nothing on them uh, and nothing beyond that at all. Like, totally in the murk. I don't even know where they could have been living. Uh, but there must have been someone 500 years ago. Mm -hmm. It must have been someone 2,000 years ago. It must have been someone 10,000 years ago, 100,000, right? It's biological reality that we have those and the choices they made back then led to you. And what kind of ancestors do we want to be? What do we want to have possible for three generations from now, 10 generations from now? Uh, we could screw it all up, <laughs> no doubt that that's uh, uh, in the cards as well. Or we can do our part to make things a little better uh, for folks. We just don't know. Mm -hmm. so we have to kind of just have faith that it makes some sense. And so I think all that's about uh, having that long temporal dimension and uh, being hopeful that we'll be doing the right things 
and down the line we'll see that we won't see the results but others get to live uh, under those big trees whose seeds we plant today. Well, we have uh, just one more uh, bonus question. Crazy things going on today. What's been keeping you sane lately in 2020? <laughs> I like that question. What keeps one sane in 2020 <laughs> in this immediacy? Uh, on one level, I have uh, three teenagers, uh, an 18-year-old and twin 16-year-olds. And I don't know if they keep me sane, <laughs> but they do keep me busy. And you know, obviously, I love my kids. Uh, and I, I like um, doing things with them and encouraging them uh, to read and get outside and engage. Uh, so that's uh, you know, a big chunk of what I do. <laughs> They've also always been really good uh, helpers in some of my projects uh, from when they were little onward. Uh, back when we did the open house at the excavations in January, uh, they came out and helped guide the, the tours uh, for it. And it was you know, uh, very much appreciated. Uh, so that's there. I started running actually for the first time this century. I had been a jogger in my youth, but I hurt my knees. And so I stopped. But uh, during this pandemic, I actually took a risk. I saw it and I actually run four times a week with my neighbors. So it's actually a really nice thing to just uh, run with them. I also go out in the woods as often as possible in every direction and into to the beach, away from people, of course, but uh, walking the beaches of uh, Sarasota Manatee, uh, going to the nature preserves and state parks and county parks is big. Uh, I still read a lot kind of you know, both professionally and for leisure. And although the skill set is not impressive at all, I started painting. Oh. Got a easel and some paints, and uh, you won't be seeing any of the <laughs> work. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it is a good way to kind of create a little bit, mm -hmm. just for myself and not get caught up in all of the challenges with COVID-19, the politics, economic concerns, uh, but to see uh, the beauty mm -hmm. it's possible and to yeah, realize that this, this, this too will pass <laughs> and we'll uh, construct something that hopefully is a little better. Very cool. Yeah. I, uh... I guess I am creative, but I'm like creative if there's boundaries. So like a blank canvas like freaks me out. What do you wow. do with it? So I'm like, I'm a knitter and a sewer. So there's like very set instructions or processes or like, this is what you do versus whatever you want. Ah. <laughs> yeah, so the blank slate, the blank canvas doesn't scare me. It's, uh, I think it's a great challenge. Yeah. Make something. And maybe one day I'll uh, get to a skill level that I, I can share it. <laughs> <laughs> it's your retirement plans. Start planning that gallery show. Ooh, that'd be exciting. <laughs> um, well, thanks very much for chatting with us today. And thanks to everyone who's uh, watching at home. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you so much for doing this, Emily Jane. I really appreciate it.